Good morning and welcome to our program this morning. I'm Raleigh Flynn, the president of the Foreign Policy Research Institute. Uh, this morning, we've got an all-star uh, panel uh, to discuss uh, the Biden administration's new Sub-Saharan Africa policy that was um, uh, published in August, 2022. Um, our speakers are Ambassador Aurelia Brazil, Ambassador David Shin and Franklin Moore. And our host this morning is Charles Ray, Ambassador Charles Ray, who is the um, chair of our Africa program and also serves on FPRI's board of trustees. Uh, for those of you who don't know Ambassador Ray, he served as the US ambassador to Zimbabwe and to the Republic of, or excuse me, the Kingdom of Cambodia, as well as having a full 20 year military career prior to joining the uh, State Department. Um, we'll be taking your questions this morning. So please put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. I'd also, before I turn the reins over to Ambassador Ray, like to say thank you to our board and our supporters and our members. We cannot do these programs without you. So please, if you're not in one of those categories, categories, please consider supporting us. Uh, without further ado, I'll um, hand it over to Ambassador Ray. Uh, thank you and welcome to all of our audience. Uh, we will, we have a, as, as uh, President Flynn said, a stellar cast this morning, uh, two former ambassadors who served in Africa and a senior USAID official. Uh, and we're going to to take a look at the current administration's Sub-Saharan Africa policy, which after a, I am told, exhaustive interagency review was finally issued uh, a, roughly a month or so ago, uh, very much awaited policy. The uh, Our panelists really need no introduction. Their, their bios were included uh, with the announcement for this event. And so I'm going to turn it over to them to give you some introductory remarks, and then we'll get into a discussion, starting with Ambassador Re Brazil, uh, followed by Ambassador, uh, I'm sorry, followed by Franklin Moore, and then hitting cleanup will be Ambassador Shin. Uh, Re, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, and good morning, everyone. My comments about this U.S. strategic strategy towards Sub-Saharan Africa is to, uh, that uh, the, the points made in the executive summary, and I want to emphasize what they are, that indicates that the U.S. and Africa will shape the rules of the world on vital issues like trade and cyber and emergency technolo emerging technologies. It says it reframes Africa's importance to the U.S. national security interest and talks about a new vision of how and with whom the U.S. engages and welcomes and affirms Africa's agency. It seeks to include and elevate Africa's voice globally, develop a more flexible regional architecture, and uh, recognize the youth as the engine of innovation and entrepreneurship. <clears throat> For me, the uh, new strategy has a, a, a new tone and a new energy behind it, uh, but it's aspirational. It, the devil will be in the details. It doesn't really spell out, in my view, um, a lot of new I, things that the U.S. would be doing. Um, in the different categories of fostering openness and open societies and delivering de <clears throat> democratic and security dividends and other issues that it discusses, it really doesn't specify how we're going to do it. It seems to suggest that um, the uh, US will talk about bilateral issues with countries, regional issues with countries, and now multilateral and global issues with countries. Um, frequently, in my experience, uh, back uh, at the change of the century, the U.S. was doing all of this already in Africa uh, with many countries. So the new uh, content for me is that it seems to be a recognition now um, 
And, and for this, I applaud uh, this, this strategic strategy, but there's a recognition that the US has uh, treated Sub-Saharan Africa as a world apart. And uh, in fact, there's a sentence that says the strategy's strength lies in its determination to graduate from policies that inadvertently treat Sub-Saharan Sub -Saharan Africa as a world apart. And policies that have struggled to keep pace with the profound transformations across the continent and the world. So that recognition in itself, to me, makes this an important document. I would drop out the word inadvertent. I think that uh, the word using the word inadvertent reflects a subliminal recognition that racism has played a role in how the U.S. has looked at Africa. And in fact, later in the uh, strategic strategy, in the section called Reflections on Three Decades of U.S. Policy, there are two sentences, again, that I would stress and say as, quote, as the president has said, the U.S. must root out systemic racism and advance efforts to create a more equi equitable country. African countries closely watch our progress. So for me, the newness in this strategic concept is the fact that the U.S. is recognizing the fact that racism and our own domestic situation uh, is important in terms of our relationship uh, with Africa and I dare say with other countries. Um, in, in terms of uh, a, another statement that it's, it says in the um, uh, strategic strategy, they talk about more contested and competitive uh, world. So it seems to also frame a polycentric kind of situation that the U.S. sees in the world, at, but yet it, in, the, in the policy, it talks mostly about China and, and Russia um, in Africa. So I would, again, on the economic side, I would, I would emphasize, and it doesn't spell it out in the strategy, but as a fact, a matter of fact, that China holds most of the debt across the developing world. Um, if you think back at the turn of the century, most of the debt held um, by in the uh, held um, across the developing countries was held by the what was called then the Paris Club, and also by multilateral institutions and organizations. So there's been a change in terms of who is holding the debt. And also Russia today does demand a degree of global influence um, because they are arms suppliers uh, in Africa, energy suppliers, they're mercenary suppliers in terms of supplying the Wagner Group, uh, fertilizer suppliers, food suppliers and the like. And so they, they uh, as their role as a supplier, but also as uh, reminding countries that they did uh, support uh, the end of colonialism and uh, more recent conflicts in Africa and using disinformation and, uh, <laughs> and money, they are trying to, to use their influence on the continent. Um, in fact, uh, you know, for example, uh, Russia is smuggling out gold from Sudan to try to support its war in uh, Ukraine. So uh, Africa plays a, a important part in uh, China and Russia's um, view of the world. And the US strategy, I think, rightly um, highlights both of those countries in terms of uh, the strategic concept um, environment within which the uh, U.S. strategy will work. So <laughs> in terms of uh, the press, I guess, in the U.S. Uh, pointing out that some African countries had um, refrained from voting uh, in the United Nations for condemning uh, 
Russia's invasion of Ukraine, um, I think the strategy rightly indicates that the US intends to continue to dialogue with every country in Africa and to lean forward uh, in terms of our discussions, even uh, when we disagree or if we disagree. So again, the strategy points out that with new energy and similar focus uh, to what we have been doing in different um, sectors, we're going to be striding forward with a recognition of our own faults and with the intention to lean forward and continue dialoguing with countries, even if we do have some slight disagreements and also to have a dialogue that's broader uh, than just the bilateral issues. I'll stop there. Thank you, uh, Mr. Moore. Thank you, Ambassador Ray. Um, let me start with, by picking up something that has already been said, and that is that the strategy is very aspirational. And I think that's useful because what one might want to compare it to is where Africans are in strategy. And the African Union, which created Agenda 2063, has done it in a way that it looks at seven aspirations that Africa has. So let me talk of three points that I think are important. The first, why a sub-Saharan strategy? Um, in some ways, the sub-Saharan strategy is very 20th century and not very 21st century. If you look at almost anything that comes out of Africa that is looking at more than one country, it comes with the following statement that the AU makes with great regularity. That statement is, the AU is a continental body consisting of 55 member states that make up the countries of the Africa continent. So the question is, why are we looking at sub-Saharan Africa when Africa itself is trying to look at the whole continent? And I think that that's critically important um, as we move forward. My second point, um, the vast majority of the strategy deals with democracy, good governance, and security. And that point is done very well, I think. I think that that is the heart and soul of the strategy. But for example, if one is going to look at security in the Sahel, and you're looking at security in northern Mali, you can't really do that without involving um, Algeria. If you're looking at security in the north of Niger, you can't do that without involving Chad. So I point those out to point out that to actually get at what we would like this strategy to get to, it requires all of Africa. My third point, it is very short on develop, what I'm going to call economic development and the support of entrepreneurs. Creating and supporting a business environment based on the rule of law is very much a part of governance. And as we have discussed governance in the document, we haven't really looked at what governance says about the economy and how we as Americans look to parts of governance, i.e. a business environment based on the rule of law as critically important for our relationships with Africa. In terms of being hopeful, um, there's not much mention of small and medium enterprises. I realize that that will come as we look at implementation, but it is nice to hint at some of that now. Now we know in America that small and medium enterprises employ 55% of workers and often are the dynamic actors in an economy. 
we should be looking forward to how do we help Africa do the same thing? How do we support the growth of existing enterprises? How do we look at diaspora, small and medium, medium enterprise, and look at its potential to create partners? I think that if you looked at the conclusion of what we would want, we would want to say something like, we look for a democracy that embraces private sector participation. I would point out that the document is 15 pages long. The words private sector do not appear until page 13. And it is not well woven into the discussion of the difference between the United States, China, and Russia as we look at the continent economically. Those are the three points I mainly wanted to make. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ambassador Shen. Well, thank you very much, uh, Charlie. I, I think it might be useful to drill down a little bit more into some of the key points in the policy on the assumption that uh, some of your viewers anyway may not be very familiar with the strategy. So let me touch on, on several that uh, jump out at me as being key to the, the Biden administration Africa policy. One, it makes very clear that it wants to defend the rules of the international system, such as sovereignty and the territorial integrity. Uh, this is where you come into direct uh, competition with China and Russia, both of whom have a different idea as to what the international rules ought to be. The uh, document also urges that uh, we fulfill the promise of democracy, promote free and fair elections, rule of law uh, and justice, and also provide a lot of support for civil society. It urges uh, that we leverage private sector engagement, uh, particularly through foreign direct investment and trade. And it may be that that appears on page 13 of the document, but I think it is a, a key point uh, in the, uh, the policy statement. Uh, talks about providing humanitarian assistance. This is a, a continuation of long-standing American policy. We've, we've always been the first with the most in Africa when it comes to humanitarian aid but also puts it in the context of improving food security, uh, recovering uh, from COVID-19. Uh, there's a reference to um, building more effective African security forces to fight extremism. This is mainly a matter of training uh, African security uh, organizations to be more effective. Uh, one can argue that we haven't been as, uh, as effective perhaps in that training as we might have been. And it also prioritizes counterterrorism, although I see very much of a diminishment of uh, focus on counterterrorism in this document as opposed to recent Africa strategies by previous administrations. Uh, it talks about combating the impact of climate change and supporting clean energy. Uh, this may be more aspirational than uh, reality. Uh, I'm not sure I have seen much yet by way of implementing that goal. And then uh, the document indicates that we would like to develop a common framework for debt relief. Uh, this has become a more important issue in, um, in Africa strategy. Uh, I would point out that the U.S. holds very little African debt because we have not been involved in loan programs in Africa in any significant way for many years. Our programs are largely grant programs. Uh, I would like to second the, uh, the comment that Franklin Moore made on the need to consider Africa as an entire geographical unit, an entire continent of um, either 54 or 55 states, depending upon whether you include Western Sahara as one, uh, I think that this artificial distinction that we have made bureaucratically for many, many decades uh, is an unfortunate one. Uh, it dates back to an earlier time frame uh, that we just haven't been able to break away from. 
And I suppose there would be some uh, disagreements perhaps with the Middle Eastern Bureau of uh, the State Department and other government agencies if you if you tried to put uh, all of the uh, African countries under one bureaucratic uh, organization or unit. But I think it, it does make sense uh, to do that. And talking about sub-Saharan Africa is a totally artificial designation. Uh, let me stop there and look forward to questions. Uh, thank you, all three of you. Very good points. I I'd like to throw something out. One of, we had a, uh, another panelist scheduled, uh, Ambassador June Carter Perry, uh, and uh, she and I had a discussion earlier one of the things that we both noticed as we were reading the strategy is that it did not really uh, address the issue of, of education, health, and economic improvement for African women and girls. And, 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 and that to her, and I agreed with her, was one of, one of the sort of weaknesses of the, of the document for me because because women uh, make up the, the bulk of the agricultural sector, uh, food security, it's gonna be important that women be included in order to achieve food security in rural areas. Oh, I'll start with Ambassador Brazil. What, what is your uh, view on, on this absence of addressing uh, the gender issues in this document? Well, I agree with uh, Ambassador uh, Perry and um, <coughs> it, it is uh, notable that there is an absence of addressing the gender issues. Uh, I think it, they're implicit, but um, they could be elevated. Um, women are, you know, extremely important in the development of, uh, of African societies and economies. So I agree with her. Ambassador Shen. Yeah, I, had, I must say I had not focused on that as being an omission. Um, if if it's not there, then I would also agree that it is unfortunate. Um, I was very quickly trying to thumb through the, uh, the speech that um, Secretary of State Antony Blinken gave uh, in connection with the announcement of the uh, strategy statement to see whether he had made any specific references to, um, to gender and, uh, and quickly going through it, it doesn't leap out at me, but I, it's a long speech and I may, may very well be missing something here. Uh, but I think it is important to think of that um, policy document also in the context of the speech that he gave in South Africa at about the same time. Uh, his speech actually gets into some more details that are I think very useful in terms to in terms of elaborating the, the policy statement. But if if in fact it's not been covered, then that is an omission. Uh, Mr. Moore, from a, from a development perspective, what's your view on that? Well, I, I think from a development perspective that there are a variety of things that are will be part of implementation that are not part of this document. I would agree that that is particularly true of women and girls. I think it's also true of youth, that it does not emphasize the need to target women. It does not emphasize the need to target youth and that those are very important components um, of the population. It makes some references to health, but does not really discuss health. It makes a reference to education, but does not discuss education. Um, I assume that there was an attempt to sort of not scattershot and say something about everything, but rather to concentrate. But I would agree with Ambassador Perry that a focus on women is um, lacking. Uh, one other issue, the, the mention, uh, I think it was you, Ambassador Shen, who mentioned that the policy is, uh, there's a, a focus in it on counterterrorism. Uh, and, and one of the center pieces of our counterterrorism has been over the horizon warfare, our, our use of, of drones or our un, unmanned aerial vehicles. And, and that has, the, the the employment of drones uh, has its own 
problems, and particularly when a lot of the targets of drone launches from sub-Saharan Africa are actually in North Africa, which is not included as part of the strategy. Uh, what, uh, how, how do you look at the use of drone warfare in, in our counterterrorism activity in Africa in the context of this policy? Uh, let's start with you, Ambassador Shin. Yeah, you know, there there are two issues I think concerning drones, and I, I think both of them are are being reevaluated uh, as we speak today by the administration. I think, based on press reports, there seem to be some concerns about past drone policy. But drones are, are effectively used for one surveillance, uh, not armed drones, and they provide one kind of um, of support for uh, countering extremist groups. And, and I think for the most part, legitimate uh, use or, or le serve legitimate purposes. The, the use of drones that's most controversial are the armed drones. And in the case of Africa, the only place I'm aware that they have been used uh, fairly consistently is in Somalia. And even there, the, the uh, number of times they have been used in recent years has dropped fairly dramatically. I may be wrong, maybe they have been used in other parts of the continent, uh, but I do know that they have been used from time to time in Somalia. And that has led to all kinds of questions about collateral damage and uh, uh, other concerns. So I, I think it is appropriate to reevaluate the use of drones, but as far as using them for surveillance purposes and, and building up intelligence, I don't have any problem with that. Ambassador Brazil? I agree completely what, uh, with Ambassador Shin. Uh, I think for surveillance, uh, for surveillance purposes, it's, it's fine. Um, I noticed um, we, we are, I guess, um, adjusting or discussing with different countries of what we will be doing. Niger recently uh, uh, met with uh, the Secretary of State and there, I think we indicated we were going to uh, provide some armored personnel carriers for Niger. Not we're not talking about drones or or any of that. And and also on the economic side, um, the strategy talks about new approaches. And I noted that the Millennium Challenge um, Corporation, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the discussion with Niger. The, that the U.S. side said the Millennium Challenge Corporation will be working on additional compacts on a regional basis as opposed to a country by country basis. And I think that's, uh, that approach could be uh, beneficial as well, working on a regional basis to provide um, some support for economic activity as opposed to a country by country basis. So as I said at the beginning, the strategy the devil is in the details. It, it will reveal itself what we're doing uh, country by country or uh, group by group, so to speak. Mr. Moore. Well, um, in terms of the drones, I agree completely with what Ambassador Shen said. I would say as we look at the whole concept of security, it was why I said, if you're interested in security in the north of Niger, you have to have Chad involved in that discussion. If you're interested in security in the north of Mali, you have to have Algeria involved in that. And um, I, I think as Ambassador Shen pointed out, um, when we are most serious about drones, they are focused outside of Sub-Saharan Africa. It may be for the benefit of Sub-Saharan Africa, but they're focused outside. And so for me, it's all more reason why you have to look at the continent as what you want to have a strategy for, not a subset of the continent. Okay, thank you. Thank you all. Uh, I, I have dozens of more questions, but in all fairness, we need to let our audience uh, address their questions. I turn it now over to President Raleigh Flynn to moderate the questions from our audience. Thank you so much, Ambassador Ray, and thanks to our panelists for a, a great conversation. We have uh, several uh, questions in the question uh, in the Q and A box, and I'll start with one 
uh, uh, the West, Europe and North America, uh, the West still thinks of sub-Saharan Africa as a political entity and our uh, speaker says it is not. Uh, this is part of the living stone and colonial eras. The U.S. Is, is one country, so is Lesotho. There is no connection or similarities between Namibia and Algeria, no similarities between Ethiopia and Mali. Uh, why doesn't uh, Joe B Biden uh, have bilateral policies rather than lumping over 40 countries in one basket? Uh, Franklin, perhaps you'd like to take that one. Okay. Well, I think to, to start with, one has to look at, we're trying to establish a partnership. So you have to look at what your partner is doing. Our partner is clearly saying that the most important institution to us is the Africa Union. And that Africa Union is made up of all of the countries of Africa. So when someone says, why are we lumping 40 countries together? Understand that there are plenty of issues that those 40 countries lump themselves together on. And so for me, I think it is critically important to look at the potential partnership and to say, okay, we will establish a partnership based upon what you African countries have articulated, and therefore that policy is a policy for the whole continent. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have a, a, a similar question. Um, well, it's not a similar question, but it's, it touches on the, um, the issue of partnership. And this is uh, a note of the policy report speaks often about partnership. I interpret that to mean that the African governments need to do more on their side to create a favorable environment for private investors. Uh, the World Bank publication, Doing Business, says that Africans hold $1 trillion outside of Africa. Why aren't Africans investing? Uh, let's, let's put that to Ambassador Brazil. Uh, thank you. Uh, and, and it's a good question uh, because if the money was uh, in, in, on the continent, in the countries uh, where the money sort of has been uh, allocated to individuals, then that would help that economy grow better. Um, I think that, well, just a, a couple of, of, of things. Uh, in the strategy, you will find there is an emphasis on bilateral issues, back to the previous question, by bilateral relationships, but an emphasis also on the fact that in discussions with each country, where the US is going to be talking about regional um, issues and multilateral issues. So the, the uh, dialogue will be um, enlarged to talk about African Union issues, other issues, and not just bilateral issues. I welcome that. In terms of the, um, the monies uh, that are outside the continent, I think that for me personally, that gets to the question of corruption and dealing with corruption on the continent. And that has to be dealt with in a, both on the country by country basis as well as, as, uh, as a, on a group basis. And I think that there are initiatives um, ongoing uh, to talk about uh, corruption um, and, and how that affects or diminishes the, the, the potential for economic growth. So I think we should not shy away from discussions about corruption. Um, we've, we've had those kinds of conversations for the past 30 years or so as, as in my memory. So I think that's an important point about the need to bring money back to the continent and not park it overseas. Thank you. Um, we have a question specifically for Ambassador Shin, and the question is, uh, you talk about the U.S. policy's commitment to terrorism in Africa, yet your government is openly supporting a terrorist group called the TPLF. Um, I think this gets at the heart of how do we define uh, terrorist groups as well, um, because, you know, one person's terrorist is another person's freedom fighter. But um, Ambassador Shen, would you like to take a crack at that? Yeah, I'd be happy to do so. I would like to go back just a second for, to the question on uh, the, the importance of having a, uh, 
bilateral foreign policies also, I would actually argue that uh, there is more focus attached by the U.S. government and other governments around the world to the bilateral relationship than the regional or continent-wide relationship. Uh, in fact, if, if the Biden administration or any other administration didn't have an Africa policy, it would be severely criticized just for not having had such a policy. So it, it has to have an Africa-wide policy. But in fact, the, the principal relationship is at the bilateral level. Uh, you have an American embassy in almost every country in Africa, and those embassies are responsible for relations just with that country, and not for the, uh, the entire region or the entire continent. On the, the issue of, of terrorist groups, uh, it is all in the eye of the beholder. And, and one person's terrorist group is another person's group of freedom fighters. And you can go round and round as to which groups ought to be included and which groups should not. Uh, I think the argument in the case of uh, the Tigrayan People's Liberation Front that is made by its critics is that if you go back into the 1980s, I think there was a brief period when the United States actually had the TPLF on a terrorist list or something akin to the terrorist list. And that is now being used today as, um, as, a, as a fact that has continued up to the present time. Now that of course is not the case in that the TPLF became the, the lead party in the Eritrean, uh, or rather in the Ethiopian people's uh, revolutionary uh, democratic front, the EPRDF, and became the organization with which the United States government and all other governments dealt with on a daily basis because it was effectively in power. Uh, then they were either forced out of power a couple of years ago or chose to leave uh, their positions of power and are now operating in Tigray region as an independent, uh, semi-independent entity. And there are critics who call them a terrorist group. Uh, the U.S. has not chosen to do that. Uh, therefore, the, the issue from the standpoint of U.S. policy is not one of, um, of supporting a terrorist group because we haven't chosen that definition at the present time. Thank you. Uh, we have another question, um, and that is, is there a need to identify the African institutions the U.S. will partner with to, to execute the One Africa policy? And Mr. Moore, why don't we hand that one to you? Um, I think there very much is uh, that need. Um, I, I would say that, that two sets of institutions, um, individual private sector actors, and universities actually have not taken as much of a potential role in place as they could. Uh, I tend to think that as you look at the institutions um, involved in the document, that they tend to be institutions that appear in, I don't wanna call it an old model, but it's a model that has not been updated to look at how we actually get at some of the most serious things that need to be done. There is a very serious need to not just have the private sector invest, but to have the private sector become a partner. Now, if the private sector, the US private sector is becoming a partner, it is helping African institutions to build what is needed to have a business environment that's based on the rule of law. It's not a passive, oh, here's the money, you do what you like. It is, we are bringing money, but we also are bringing some need for change in the environment in which we are operating with you in partnership. So I, I think there's a, a need to look at institutions, organizations, I would love to see someone talk about something like a small business administration for each African country so that they can begin to deal better with small and medium enterprise. Oh, thank you. We have another question. Could I, uh, sure, I jump in? Absolutely. Um, 
I think, I mean, there are groups on the continent as well, uh, ECOWAS and ECA and African Union and IGAD and other groups that already exist that have over time developed the habits of consultation. And I think looking at those uh, groupings to see if they would broaden out their mandate or perhaps even narrow it and to, in some instances to focus on issues that are current now and looking toward the future uh, would be important. I also think the US private sector needs to, or perhaps is in the process of learning more about Africa. When I, uh, back at the turn of the century, uh, in my view, the US private sector was using South Africa as its entree into the entire continent. And it, it would locate in South Africa and then try to service the entire continent. And I recall hearing of, of critical voices uh, in different African countries about that approach because uh, the markets were not being uh, looked at individually by US business, but sort of uh, as a collective. So I think educating uh, the US private sector would be important in terms of adjusting its approach to doing business on the continent and increasing uh, their activity. Um, speaking of the AU, we have another question that uh, asks, is the panel aware that through the AU there is the creation of an African currency, the Cowrie, to facilitate intra-Africa trade? Uh, Mr. Moore, Ambassador Brazil, do you think that would affect this? I think creating the Cowrie currency is uh, it, it's a wonderful idea. I think as countries come together to create joint currencies, um, they find out that that is not quite as easy as one may think it is. And that uh, you only have to look at the creation of the Euro among very stable economies um, that understood each other well, how difficult that was. So I think it's aspirational, but I don't think it's something that if I were African countries, I would start down the road on tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, Ambassador Shen, we have a question about energy security concerns. Um, how do those play into the strategy? And uh, can you comment on what some of those energy security concerns are? I'm not sure whether the uh, person asking the question is talking about African energy concerns or U.S. energy concerns. I, I assume <laughs> uh, it's African, but uh, I may be misreading the question. Um, if, if you're talking about African energy concerns, you have two very different groups uh, of countries in Africa. You have those who are energy blessed, who have a lot of oil and or gas, or in a few cases, even geothermal or other kinds of, uh, of energy, potentially solar. Uh, and you have those who are, who are um, energy uh, deprived. Uh, who are importing large quantities of, of oil, uh, mostly oil, in order to supply the electricity that they need. Uh, and you have some real sort of different approaches to energy by these two different groups of countries, not surprisingly. Um, I, I'm assuming that one is talking here about those African countries that are energy deprived and how do they go about improving their situation? Uh, looking at it from perhaps a, admittedly a Western point of view, uh, I would hope that they would focus more and more on renewables. Uh, they, the Africans have taken considerable advantage of hydropower across the continent. I think that's a good thing. The prime example of that is the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam and, and Ethiopia that uh, it will be, once it is completed, the largest uh, dam in all of Africa and provide more hydropower than any other uh, facility on the continent. It's a controversial because it has impacts on water reaching um, Sudan and Egypt. Uh, but you've had relatively little development of other uh, renewable sources, particularly solar. And I think that's where there needs to be an enormous emphasis in, in parts of Africa that, for whatever reason, has not yet happened. 
And I think the United States, among others, uh, could be useful in uh, promoting solar, the use of solar energy in Africa. Yeah, the, the questioner, by the way, just clarified that they were talking about U.S. energy. Oh, <laughs> and now that I've expanded a great line by Africa. We all uh, learn from your answer on domestic. Well, let, let me just say very briefly, if, if you're talking about U.S. energy, keep in mind that, that uh, it wasn't very long ago that the U.S. was a major importer of, uh, of African oil, mainly from West Africa. That has almost dried up. We're, we're importing very little oil from Africa these days because of fracking in the United States. And there simply isn't right. a need to import oil from any part. Of, there's not a need to import large quantities of oil from any part of the world, including Africa. So we, we, the United States isn't really looking so much to Africa today for meeting its energy concerns. Maybe 20 years from now, that will all change, and we'll have to turn again to Africa and other parts of the world. But for the moment, uh, the U.S. is in pretty good shape on uh, supplying most of its own energy needs. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Moore, we have, we have a question. The new U.S.-Africa strategy acknowledges the region's youth as an engine of entrepreneurship and innovation. Do you have any specific recommendations as to how the U.S. government should engage the youth across the continent that will support meaningful economic and democratic gains for the continent? Ooh, that's a heavy one. Um, let me start by saying that it's going to require that as we look at our forums of discussion, that we make sure we have forums where youth are actively involved. If you look at the vast majority of youth in Africa, they are involved in informal economic um, activities. The degree to which we can help them formalize those activities i.e. the degree to which they understand better what are the rules of engagement economically, the more they understand where and how they can get infusions of cash, be it loaned cash, invested cash, et cetera, are all critically important to helping youth find a way. I would also say that there is some active desire among youth that are diaspora youth living here in the United States, first and second generation Americans whose families have come from Africa, to look back and look at potential partnership. We should be encouraging forums like that. We do it with the young leaders, but we need to have more forums that allow more people to from both the US and Africa to engage with each other to look at are there potential ways to move forward together. I think that's critically important. Thank you. If, I could, if yeah. I could jump in too, I think we need to emphasize more on education. And uh, as I understand, as, as I read through the, the, the strategy, I, I didn't really see a heavy emphasis on education. I mentioned it mentions online education but doesn't mention education on the continent. I think we have a lot of, um, or several US universities that are located on the, uh, have programs on the continent. So to the extent that we can sort of weave them together somehow and, and increase their numbers and educate youth on, on the continent, that would be important. So education to me uh, is, is critical again, uh, with emphasis on, on young people. Um, Africa itself has had a, a lot of students now studying around the world, both in uh, China, uh, Russia, the US, and in Europe. And I think that they, if they can exploit the fact that those people now have cultural competency and understanding of the languages and also the culture of the countries where they study, that can also augment uh, somehow the uh, the economic activity, both of youth as, as well as other, just in general, because they have the, the cultural competency and should exploit that. No, thank you. Um, 
We have a, a, a question from Ambassador Hank Cohen. He says, the King of Morocco once said to me that he would recommend that North Africa be merged with Africa in the U.S. bureaucracy. Uh, and he went on in Near East Asia, uh, when it's categorized like that, no, nobody cares about us, as in Morocco and Africa. We should be in AF. Do you agree? Um, Ambassador Shin. Well, I, I think uh, we sort of talked about that earlier, and I, certainly Franklin Moore and I agree on that. I, I suspect that uh, Rhee does also. Uh, clearly, uh, it makes more sense to talk about a geographical unit. The, the one country that becomes sort of difficult in terms of placing is Egypt. It, it very much has a foot in the Middle East, and it has a foot in, uh, in Africa, and it can rightly be uh, in both uh, the Middle East and, and Africa. I think the rest of North Africa is, is increasingly, and with the passage of time, more closely linked to Africa than it is to the Middle East, uh, even though they, they are traditional Arab countries. But uh, I, I think that does make sense. Okay. If, if I may make just one statement yes. about Egypt. Interestingly, we will see at the next uh, Conference of Parties for Climate Change, which is being hosted in Egypt as an African country, we will get a chance to see how African Egypt can sometimes be. So for, for me, there's a little jury out on. I, I, I agree that, that they are the hardest to place, but they are trying to move forward in ways that tie them more directly to Africa. So they are the African host for climate change. And it will be interesting to see their behavior during the COP. Thank you. If I could just also yeah. uh, stress the, the sentence in the strategy that I quoted at the beginning. It says the strategy's strength lies in its determination to graduate from policies that, in it, well, that says inadvertently, but policies that treat Sub-Saharan Africa as a world apart. And that, offers the suggestion that perhaps the U.S. will begin to look at and uh, recognizes that sub-Saharan Africa is an artificial creation and that you sh we should look at the continent as a whole uh, for, for our strategy and our policy. So I hold out hope that we'll change. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have another question. How important, if at all, are U.S.-French relations in aiding West African states to combat extremism in the Sahel? What forums exist for this kind of cooperation? How might the relationship evolve? Um, Ambassador Shen, you want to tackle that one? Sure. I, I think the relationship is very important, uh, the U.S.-French relationship, uh, pretty much throughout Africa, particularly Francophone Africa, but, but Africa generally. Uh, of, of all the former colonial powers, um, France has maintained sort of the closest connection with its former colonies, sometimes in a very positive way, sometimes in a less positive way. Uh, but the fact remains that there, there is uh, truly uh, an interest in France to maintain these relationships. There's a lot of knowledge there, and it's in the interest of the United States to maintain a close relationship with France, while obviously paying close attention to what the Africans think about all of this, because they don't always agree with, uh, with what France is doing in Africa. Uh, and this, I would say, is especially true in the security sector. Uh, and I think there is pretty close collaboration between the, uh, the French and the American military. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Moore, I'm going to give you this one. Uh, it the question goes, we dialogue about partnerships. Is there any recognition or intent to collaborate with citizen diplomacy partners, such as Sister Cities International, uh, who are launching an initiative to add 500 new U.S. Africa partners over the 133 existing? And this is from Mary Palco, who is with SCI Global Envoy. I think that the, the, the number of civil society relationships with Africa is vast and strong. It could be stronger, um, but if you look historically over time, it is primarily 
non-government organizations and citizen-based organizations that creep out from the capital and are engaged in a variety of activities that are out in rural areas, out in areas that seem to be not as important politically. I think that to the degree that we are looking at social relationships between Americans and Africans, that's very important. I think that it is also important to begin to look more closely at what are some of the potential economic aspects of that. You know, the hardest thing when you are engaged, I think, in looking at economic growth, the hardest thing is what do you do to the woman in a village who has come to understand raising chicken, and build a business that is large truly a medium-sized enterprise that is critically important. And I think to the degree that it is private sector and um, private citizen organizations that are filling in that gap, that's very important. Thank you. We have just a few minutes left and I'd like to give each of you an opportunity to say um, in uh, a minute or less, uh, anything, any other observations you might like to share with, with our audience. Ambassador Brazil? Well, thank you. Um, I would just mention also Amer American Chambers of Commerce, um, across the continent are very active and have uh, a depth of relationships that, that are private sector and civil society. Um, and I think that's very important. In terms of, um, of the strategy, as I said, the, the devil will be in the details uh, of, of this strategy. Uh, but for me, uh, the fact that it, for the first time in my memory, um, the US, at, uh, uh, strategy in includes reference to the fact that the U.S. must root out systemic racism and advance our own efforts to create a more equitable country and that African countries closely watch our progress is, is new and hasn't been said uh, before and certainly in that way that it caught my attention. And I think that's very important because I think African countries can speak to us about some of the changes that we need to uh, consider uh, making in this country. And I'll just end with quoting James Baldwin, who's one of my favorite, favorite authors, is that not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. So <laughs> I think this strategy holds out the um, opportunity for the US and African countries to face what we need to face to move forward. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador Shin. Yes, uh, I, I've been looking and reading uh, U.S. government policy statements towards Africa since the 1960s. And as I think back on them, there's an enormous amount of sameness in them, at least in terms of the issues that are cited. Now, not all the issues are the same. Uh, times change and, and there are some new issues that come along. For example, if you were to go back to the 60s and the 70s, you would find no mention of climate change you would find probably no mention of, uh, of counterterrorism because it wasn't that big of an issue back then. Uh, so there, there are some new issues that come along. The more important thing is that priorities tend to change. And the focus of the document is different from one administration to the other. In the case of the Biden policy, there is an, there is a, an effort to de-emphasize uh, the uh, competition with China and Russia. It's still very much there. It hasn't gone away at all. But as compared to the Trump administration, it's not the central focus uh, of the policy statement. So while um, there are things that uh, remain the same over the years, there are also things that do change. Thank you. Mr. Moore. Um, I think that as we look at some of the new issues that are emerging, that it's really critically important that we look to use different institutions at points in time. Um, I've talked a lot about the private sector. 
I mentioned universities. Universities are institutions that have a wide reach um, and already have reaches into many countries and are interested in doing more. I would say that that is also true for many research institutions that would like to engage more directly with African countries. So I think in some ways, it is true that the devil is in the details and those are details of implementation. But as we look at that implementation, it would be useful for us to also look at what are some of the institutions that mean we may want to use in different ways to attack what Ambassador Shin has pointed out are often similar problems that have existed for the past 40 years. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador Ray, any final comments? Uh, yeah, first I'd like to thank our three panelists for, for outstanding presentations. And, and I would point out that uh, the, the, this strategy is in, in its tone new uh, but I, I agree with Ambassador Shin. Uh, there, there is a certain amount of sameness other than, you know, the, the changes that happen over time. Uh, in, in my view, uh, one of the things that, that I think the administration and the Department of State can focus on to, to ensure at least more of an acceptance on the continent of the strategy uh, would be to look at some of the administrative things that that we on the U.S. side can do to underscore the, the legitimacy and, and the validity of it, starting with, for example, ensuring that our embassies on the continent are adequately staffed to do the jobs that they have. This is an issue uh, that recently was, was highlighted uh, that, that our, our embassy is understaffed. Uh, I did a survey of, of ambassadorial appointments, uh, and, and while, you know, Africa wasn't that much worse than the rest of the world, uh, the current administration was rather slow off the mark in getting chief of missions nominated, and then, of course, Congress drug its feet in getting some confirmed. But, but some of these pedestrian administrative bureaucratic things that need to be focused on to, to provide a legitimate underpinning to this policy is something that I think the administration can, can ill afford to ignore. Thank you, Ambassador Ray, and thank you to our panel for an excellent discussion. Uh, again, uh, thanks to our audience and consider supporting us and check out our website, www.fpri.org. Lots of articles on Africa and other interesting places in the world. I wish you all a good day and goodbye. <laughs>